Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Perspective Philosophy, where we try to better our perceptions of the world through philosophical discussion. So today's episode will be a quick rebunk of the debunk of the bunk. So in other words, I will be responding to Ask Yourself's response to my last video. So you get the idea. As anyone who followed uh, the history of perspective philosophy getting destroyed on this topic would know, he profoundly hates Name the Trait. So not the best of starts. I never said I hated Name the Trait. I just don't like poor arguments because poor arguments lead to wrong conclusions. The last thing I would want is for someone to thoroughly examine their position and come to the conclusions that they should not be vegan just because the argument that was given was a poor one. Also, I don't know how you've destroyed me on this topic since we've never debated it. I made a video debunking Name the Trait and you never responded. So if you'd like to debate it, you know I'm more than happy to. And Shadow would be also. I, I can ask him, I'm pretty sure he will be anyway. Ask Yourself's position is far more obscure and that might be because he lacks the terminology to describe it. Ask Yourself does describe that he believes we can have morally truth apt statements, meaning he believes in moral realism, but that these are totally dependent upon the attitudes or the mental states of the individual. Okay, two things. Firstly, it's funny that perspective philosophy criticizes my understanding of the terminology associated with metaethics, then in the next breath demonstrates his own lack of understanding of the terminology associated with metaethics by conflating cognitivism and realism. He thinks that my position is realist in virtue of the fact that I believe moral statements are truth apt. This does not make my position realist, this makes my position cognitivist. The question of whether moral statements are truth apt is the question of cognitivism, not the question of realism. Cognitivists believe that moral statements are truth apt, non-cognitivists do not believe that moral statements are truth apt. You can have cognitivist forms of non-realism, like error theory, where moral statements are truth apt, but the truth value is always false. So unless you want to take the fringe position that error theory is a form of realism, you should retract your claim that my position is realist in virtue of the fact that I believe moral statements are truth apt. That just means that my position is cognitivist. So you can actually have cognitive forms of non-realism. This is true. Error theory would be one of them. So I can see why you might think that I'm referring to cognitivism when I'm referring to realism. I should have been more clear and said that not only do you believe that your statements are truth apt, but that you also believe that they obtain. This would be realism, because moral realism would argue that we can have moral knowledge. Propositions are truth apt, and they obtain truth value. So I can understand how Ask Yourself got confused here, because I did say that he was a moral realist in light of the fact that he thought his statements were truth apt. Now, I should have been clear to say that he not only thinks they are truth apt, but they obtain. That is what moral realism is. To argue that a statement, a proposition, is actually true against something else. So this is to say that, you know, if you believe that murder is wrong, that not only is that statement apt for truth, but that it will also obtain truth. Okay? Although I do think I implied this within the video, I did say that they purported to the mental states of the agents or the attitudes of the agent. I never said that it didn't purport to anything and that they were actually apt against something else. There was a truth value proposed and I think it was also clear within Ask Yourself's statements that he thought this to be the case. I think if anything, my position was put forward the most clearly. I was the only one who condensed my position on metaethics down to two propositions. Indexed moral statements are truth apt and the truth value of indexed moral statements is determined by the attitude of the subject that they're indexed. The truth value so I'm actually unsure of whether this is disingenuous on Isaac's part or misinformed. Two. So Ask Yourself holds the position of a non-cognitivist. At least that's what Cosmic Skeptic seemed to take away from it and me also. Uh, no, I'm a cognitivist. I think that moral statements are truth apt, as I thought you knew because a minute ago you said that I'm a realist in virtue of the fact that I'm a cognitivist. Maybe I'll just play these two clips side by side and allow the audience to determine if perspective philosophy has any idea what cognitivism and non-cognitivism are. He believes we can have morally truth apt statements. Ask yourself holds the position of a non-cognitivist. He believes we can have morally truth apt statements. Ask yourself holds the position of a non-cognitivist. He believes we can have 
morally truth apt statements, ask yourself holds the position of a non cognitivist. He believes we can have morally truth apt statements. Ask yourself holds the position of a non cognitivist. So I know I've hit that threshold again where all the philosophy people are cringing. This is just like basic level nonsense. He obviously doesn't know what the terms mean. First, Non-cognitivism and moral realism are not necessarily incompatible. Non-cognitivists can be moral minimalists, meaning that they believe that their statements are apt for truth and obtain, and so they are realists, but only against themselves. This means that a moral minimalist would only believe that an expression such as murder was wrong was only true against itself and was an actual expression of an attitude of the agent and can be treated as true or false. This means that expressions such as I think murder is right and I don't like murder can be treated as true or false against one another and be shown to be in contradiction. This is the position of Alan Gibbard, the thinker I argued Ask Yourself's position was reminiscent. So to be clear, I'm not saying Ask Yourself is a robust moral realist. I'm a robust moral realist and we have very different positions. I would argue that my truth statements obtain to something other than my emotional states. Well, he wouldn't. Also, it should be clear that I did compare Isaac's position to Alan Gibbard and called him a quasi-realist. This is a position of anti-realism in a robust sense, but still a moral realist, but moral minimalism. So the point of him being a minimalist should have been clear when I described him as a quasi-realist and not, you know, a robust realist. Quasi-realism is a form of moral minimalism. Of course, he didn't actually deal with this point. I also did say that he thought truth statements were only apt against attitudes and not apt against anything ontologically objective. So I was never arguing that he was a realist in a robust sense, and I think this is pretty clear. And that perhaps Isaac's being disingenuous by trying to point out a semantic problem that doesn't exist, but using it to claim victory and show a contradiction in order to not actually deal with the point I made about his position. So if you're one of his viewers, if you're one of his fans and you want to know what his position is, ask him, is he a quasi-realist? It's also funny that perspective philosophy says that my position is obscure compared to the other positions on stage. I think if anything, my position was put forward the most clearly. I was the only one who condensed my position on metaethics down to two propositions. Indexed moral statements are truth apt and the truth value of indexed moral statements is determined by the attitude of the subject that they're indexed to. So Isaac, remember that it is not the number of propositions you give, but the quality of the explanation. I don't think you explained yourself very well. You did reduce it down to two points. The detail of the explanation is non-existent. You've described all of subjectivism with those statements. The explanation you gave and the propositions you gave are actually pretty much the propositions you'll find describing subjectivism on Wikipedia. Now, that's a pretty broad statement to make and describes numerous positions that's pretty overarching. So I'm not exactly happy with the Wikipedia explanation of subjectivism. It could do with more work, perhaps be a little bit more refined or even less refined if you want to include non-cognitivists into subjectivism, which is arguably the case. Please just explain your position. Like, it's not as if you're un incapable of doing it. Just think about whether you're a quasi-realist and then get back to me. So this critique is pretty damning and is got to be the most potent critique Ask Yourself gave. And it's of my grammar. What is with this text? Why is vegan capitalized in one sentence but not the other, and also in the video title? And why is the word shouldn't capitalized? Very strange. I am truly, truly sorry, Isaac. I shouldn't have capitalized shouldn't. And yes, I should have capitalized both vegan in each, you know, box. But I am dyspraxic, I hope you do forgive me, and I formally concede this point. Then, secondly, Perspective thinks that he's got some big gotcha on me right here. Oh my god, Ask Yourself thinks that some people shouldn't go vegan. But he doesn't actually unpack how I'm using the moral language there, and if he were to unpack my use of moral language, he would understand that all I'm saying is some people have a negative attitude towards going vegan, which is a completely uncontroversial claim. If he wants to argue that, I would love to see his case against it. I am very well aware that most people have a negative attitude towards going vegan. That's pretty much everyone before they go vegan. I myself hated the idea, but luckily many of us don't find it a good justification for causing the unnecessary suffering of others. Something which I think your position 
could work towards adopting. Or you could imagine like some sort of advanced computer that was driven to destroy humanity. Would we be in ethical conflict with that computer and its drives? Have you been juicing? I would argue no. Pretty hilarious position. So <laughs> if a if a AI wants to destroy humanity, we don't have a conflict of values with that AI. So I'll explain what a conflict of value means to me here. All that means is that if we were to write out our list of values, us and then the AI, that those lists would not be the same. <laughs> it's pretty simple. <laughs> I understand that you're saying that we can come into conflict with the AI, but by saying the AI has values, you've already prescribed qualities upon the AI. You're saying that the AI itself has values. It doesn't. It has no quality of experience. It has a drive, a computer program, something which is semantic, unlike the values within an individual which relate to our emotional states, our feelings, our subjective experience. We require a quality of experience in order to have a valuation of the world. That's what value means. It means to have evaluated the world. An AI, if it's semantic, if it isn't sentient, if it's not subjective, it hasn't evaluated the world. So we can't conflict its values. Can we ethically conflict against a hurricane? We can say that our values conflict against the hurricane. I don't want the hurricane to destroy my house, but can the hurricane's values conflict against mine? Ask Yourself tries to force Cosmic Skeptic into relating this to brain states and explaining it that way. Okay, well, are they brain states? And then you have this empirical yes. problem of you have to show what the brain states are and that they always entail each other. And if you can't do that, then just asserting it will turn into like question begging, basically. Uh, no, I'm not trying to force him into anything. I'm delivering a critique against his argument for the non-existence of irreconcilable value differences. Now, for anyone who wants to understand my critique, I actually formalized it after that discussion and emailed it to Cosmic, so I'll just read you my email. Uh, so I said, great having you on the stream. I formalized my little critique of your case against irreconcilable value differences. I know you like to make sure your views are as tight as possible, so you may find this useful. Your argument. Premise one. If everyone's fundamental desire is pleasure, then there can't be irreconcilable differences of value. Premise two. Everyone's fundamental desire is pleasure. Conclusion. Therefore, there can't be irreconcilable differences of value. That's just P implies Q, P, therefore Q. My counterargument. Premise one. If desire and pleasure are synonyms, then it's not the case that if everyone's fundamental desire is pleasure, then there can't be irreconcilable differences of value. Premise two. If it's not the case that desire and pleasure are synonyms, then you need an account for why desire entails pleasure. Conclusion. Therefore, either it's not the case that if everyone's fundamental desire is pleasure, then there can't be irreconcilable differences of value, or you need an account for why desire entails pleasure. That's just R implies not P implies Q, not R implies S, therefore not P implies Q and or S. Why accept the premises of the counterargument? Premise one is expressing the idea that if desire and pleasure are synonyms, then all a sentence like everyone's fundamental desire is pleasure is telling us is everyone's fundamental desire is a desire. This is a tautology. It's just saying A equals A. So it's true, but it doesn't give us a reason to think there are no irreconcilable value differences because this tautology would be true even if there were irreconcilable value differences. Premise two is just showing that if you want to go the other way and say desire and pleasure aren't synonyms, then you'll be tasking yourself with explaining why desire entails pleasure. For example, if both desire and pleasure are brain states, then a stable inductive proof that they entail each other could come in the form of brain data showing that whenever the desire state is present, so is the pleasure state. Why is the conclusion of my argument a problem for your view? If the conclusion is true, then either, on the interpretation where they're synonyms, your P1 is false, which stops you from reaching your conclusion, or, on the interpretation where they aren't synonyms, you're forced into the challenge of providing an account for desire always entailing pleasure, or the argument will just be begging the question on this point. Hope that's helpful. Keep well. And for what it's worth, I think this argument worked pretty well, and I didn't even have it formalized at the time. Cosmic Skeptic, who I respect very much and consider to be a very reasonable person, actually conceded a bunch of ground to this argument. At the very start, he was saying that on his view, desire and pleasure are synonyms, or very likely could be synonyms, and that there's no problem with the fact that their synonymity would turn sentences like, if you desire X, then X gives you pleasure, or if X gives you pleasure, then you desire X, into tautologies. But after running this argument, he conceded that it certainly can't be the case that on his view, desire and pleasure are synonyms, because then his argument against irreconcilable value differences will completely lose its force. I don't know why you insist upon explaining formal logic every time you construct an argument. I do think Cosmic Skeptic was a little bit confused, but I think he was trying to explain that his position was that 
desire and pleasure entailed one another, not necessarily that they were the same thing. And I think that rationality rules try to explain this to you. Sorry, I was just going to say, would it, would it perhaps be better to say that one's contingent, as you were saying, where it all reduces down to the the uh, the wanting the pleasure. So when you say, like, I want to do this, it's not the same thing. It's more that that is contingent on this and perhaps a fact about the world. My point of saying you're forcing him into this notion of brain states and that it wasn't a regular critique was to show that it is an unnecessary goalpost to make the point empirical. You don't have to show that desire and pleasure empirically entail one another. You have to show that they logically can entail one another before he can make that argument or that they do or they must. That is, the, that is the whole point of philosophy. We all don't necessarily need to be empiricists or materialists in this sense. Even if we were, we would still rely upon the rigour of logic and its application would point us at least in the right direction. So why is the goalpost empirical? It's unnecessary. So this is where Ask Yourself now asks rationality rules to name the trait, of course. So what rationality rules does, rather than naming the trait, he says that the trait difference would not be of the animal and the human, but instead be within his judgment. It's very like perspective philosophy to be able to watch the entire segment of the video where Cosmic and I painstakingly explain why this response to name the trait that rationality rules is giving is a category error and still come out not understanding what the problem is. So I'll try to explain it yet again, okay? What we're doing is holding rationality rules value system constant and asking, what would have to change about the human in order for them to become the kind of being that rationality rules would not value? Now, if he answers by saying his values would have to change, his attitude would have to change, anything like that, that's not an answer to the question that we're asking because the question that we're asking holds his values constant, okay? What we're doing is holding his values constant, changing the human, and asking at what point the human becomes a being that he'd be comfortable murdering. What we're not doing is holding the human constant and changing his values and asking at what point his values would support murdering the being in question. So if you can't understand that's a category error, I just don't know what I could say to you. That's just, it's insane if you can't comprehend that. So as I said, rationality rules does not name the trait. That means it wouldn't be a category error. I would argue that Rationality Rules' point was a finer ontological point that essentially attacks the foundations of your argument. Now, I understand that what you and Cosmic Skeptic wanted to say was that although he does value chickens because of some internal mechanism, that it still requires, you know, a chicken to have its properties that make him see it and perceive it as a chicken, object A, and a human to have their properties and perceive it as object B, so that there can be a differentiation in value, because otherwise they would be indiscernible and they would have the same value. But this is the point, because if he values object A and object B as object A and object B for two separate reasons, it could be that the traits are irreducible. It doesn't actually matter what the traits are. The whole point is, is he does value object A and object B, and that the contradiction may arise when you try and describe these traits, but the description is a problem in our description of self. We are describing the values wrong. The values are self-evident. So in saying that you are in contradiction by not valuing the chicken whilst valuing the human, what you'd really be saying is that secondary propositions built upon our value statements have caused a contradiction in the values. Now you said yourself that rationality rules was being held constant. And at that point, he valued A and B as two separate entities. So how could his values contradict one another? They are self-evident values based upon these two separate objects. And no matter how we describe these objects, those values will remain as their self-evident constant positions as his judgment, as you've said, is being held constant. It doesn't make any sense, Isaac. So what that means that you have to do and what you are forced to do is make the objects indiscernible to begin with. You break the objects down into a set criteria and then equalize them and then claim that he always valued the chicken or that he must value the chicken or he's in contradiction. Of course, by doing that, you've never actually had a chicken and a human. You've merged them together to be one single entity all along. You've created some sort of obscure human chicken and saying that he values human chickens. Now, the whole point is, is that this is a second object. 
it could not possibly be object A and object B if we had object A and object B in the first place. It breaks the identity of indiscernibles, a point that you've never managed to actually overcome. So if you want to know more about that, check out me name the traitor video in the description below and in that corner. Just to clarify this, rationality rules was not in co would not be shown to be in conflict with himself, but rather that his description would be shown to be in conflict with his description. What you're trying to argue is that why he doesn't value chickens is in conflict with why he values humans. Whilst what I'm saying is that he's given an, a poor explanation of self and he's been forced to do that by name the trait. The values were held as self-evident to begin with. Otherwise, you'd be saying that he does not know his own values. If you're saying he does not know his own values, then please tell me how he could discover them anyway. So Isaac, unless you're arguing that everyone is actually a secret vegan, in which case, wouldn't you be contradicting your statement in the first place, arguing that all you are saying is that some people have a negative attitude towards being vegan? You would understand that all I'm saying is some people have a negative attitude towards going vegan, which is a completely uncontroversial claim. Then surely you would accept the point that rationality rules could not be in contradiction with himself unless he was already vegan to begin with, which by his own admission, he isn't. Also for you vegans out there who are probably, you know, screaming at your screens going, Lewis, why are you making an argument to defeat name the trait? Know that I'm only making this to point that we as vegans do not argue that, you know, you already do value chickens because you value humans, but rather that you should value chickens, that you should value animals and that there is a logical necessity that entails value upon others. And that is the point vegans make we prescribe values. We say that there is a logical necessity that is objective from us that we must obey, that we have a duty towards the treatment of other beings. So as a vegan, I'll happily say you should value a chicken. You should value a human. You should value others because of their own sake. Okay, so this has got to be one of my all-time favorite perspective philosophy quotes. Uh, it's right up there with you can't be a subjectivist and a vegan. <laughs> So I absolutely stand by my point, a subjectivist can't be a vegan. If anyone would like to debate me on this, have at me. Hit me up, we can debate it, we can discuss it, whatever. But no, subjectivists can't be vegan. I'll make a video on that in the future. Just to clarify that position, I don't mean that they couldn't live a vegan lifestyle in the sense that they could avoid the use of animal products and byproducts, but this would be a purely atomistic fact. But that veganism itself is actually a way of living and a philosophy. It is an ethical stance, it is a moral stance which permeates our actions. And obviously, if we are to have any prescriptive value, we should desire for it to be an objective case that people should go vegan. Now, I'm not saying that our desires entail it to be the case, but rather that it is the case and that's a good thing. So Isaac is being completely disingenuous when he argues that he would require a formalization of our argument for him to understand the inference structure. It actually breaks Leibniz's law. Leibniz's law is also sometimes called the identity of indiscernibles. The identity of indiscernibles is an ontological principle or a metaphysical principle in which we understand an object by what it is. So I would understand Socrates as Socrates because he has all of the pro properties of Socrates. He is Socrates in every single identical way. He is nothing that would make him not Socrates, otherwise he would no, not be able to be called Socrates in the first place. So to put this simply, X is X. Now, this is where I think Ask Yourself is making the mistake, because by saying that animals and humans are trait equalizable, he's either saying that they are trait equalizable in a way that means that they can be two separate distinct objects, in which case his conclusion does not flow, because I can value as a subjectivist whatever distinction is placed between these two objects. I can value A or B in any variation of ways simply for being A and B based on my emotional states, my judgments. However, if my judgment on these objects is made identical, then it must break Leibniz's law. In other words, all of the predicates, all of the properties that an object has must be made identical and we no longer have two distinct objects, we only have one. In which case, the objects are now indiscernible, they are identical, and we have one single 
metaphysical object, and we never had to to begin with. Okay, so I can't say I understand what argument Perspective is making here. This whole crew of goons, him, foot soldier, etc., have been trying to make this argument that name the trait violates the law of identity for months. A bunch of us have requested that they make this into a syllogism. They simply won't do it. They insist on only giving us natural language rambles. So there's just no way for us to actually know what the inference structure is here. Now, two people have stepped to the plate to actually defend this notion. The first was Foot Soldier, who I easily crushed. He couldn't even generate premises and a conclusion. <laughs> Not even, I didn't even ask him to make it formal. Just give me premises and a conclusion. He couldn't even do that. So what I'm saying is that if you do not actually have an argument, then what we can do is we can pick this up at a later date when you actually have an argument. So do you actually want to deliver an argument or would you like to do this at a later date when you do have an argument did you, you don't do you want to actually deliver an argument, argument or would you like talk. to continue Anytime this I at talk, a later date when you have an argument wow this is just do terrible. you actually want to deliver an argument or do you want to continue this at a later date when you have built an argument so you, you're saying that I require an argument with yes. set premises in yes. order to talk about how <laughs> your argument is here yeah, yeah. If you want to, foot soldier, if you want to come into a debate and your conclusion is P or Q, then I expect you to have an argument for P or Q. Yes, I'm call me crazy. And the other is this little debate champion from their server called Magnus, who I also easily crushed. He generated an argument that has the conclusion that name the trait violates the law of identity, but then he couldn't give us any reason to believe one of the premises of that argument. So his case just bottomed out. And I know that perspective can't do any better, right? But if he wants to try, I mean, I doubt he even knows basic logic, but I'm sure he can find someone who can help him. I would love to see this argument actually put into a syllogism so we have any idea whatsoever what you're trying to say. So formalization is only really required to, you know, explain away problems of syntax, where the meaning has been lost in the translation, where you don't understand the words I am saying and it's being lost in the way I'm saying it. Now that would be fair enough, except is he telling me that he doesn't understand my critique of his first premise when I say that total trait equalization requires him to break Leibniz's law? And that's because to equalize all predicates ontologically of an object is to make them indiscernible. If he doesn't understand that, I'm not sure how clear I can make it even with a, with a formal syllogism. I could write point one, point two, conclusion. It's not really going to get more clear than that. So as well, I would recommend that you all check out Chattel's video on formalization. It's a really good video and it explains when it's appropriate to ask for a formalized argument and the usefulness of asking for formal arguments. Also, so far you've debated Foot Soldier and Magnus, but not me. And I absolutely appreciate Foot Soldier and Magnus's attempts at arguing mine and Chattel's argument and I absolutely condemn you for how you've treated them in the past for trying to do so. So rather than me going on about this, if you want to check out Foot Soldier defending himself, it's in the description below, and he can say in his own words what happened in their debate. What your argument ultimately needs to do is show that somehow the law of identity is violated by saying we have a series of worlds, in the first world we have a human, in the last world we have an animal, and in every intermediate world we have some alteration on that initial set of propositions gradually closer and closer to the set of propositions that the animal has in the final frame. So I don't know how that could possibly violate the law of identity and I'd love to see this uh, incoherent ramble put into syllogistic form. So I had actually heard of him using arguments of alternative worlds or possible worlds being created by name the trait to resolve the problem of it breaking the law of identity. This doesn't resolve the problem, and I don't understand how Isaac doesn't understand this. So what Isaac wants us to conclude is that if I value object A in world 1, that I also must value object A in world 2. So I was going to use a clip from Rick and Morty to exemplify my criticism of Ask Yourself's Name the Trait defense regarding possible worlds. Unfortunately, it got copyright striked by Adult Swim, so you're just going to have to 
deal with the still or check out the video yourselves. So Rick is like a narcissist throughout all of Rick and Morty, right? His self-love is permanently clear and he even acts to defend himself in this scene. Yet he is seen massacring loads of other Ricks in this episode. I think it's called the Rick Shank Redemption. Really great episode, hilarious, right? But Isaac would be arguing that he would be logically, that he would be incapable of acting in such a way and still love himself, that he would be in contradiction. Well, that's not the case, because clearly these are separate Ricks. They are not the same Rick, and instead they are separate entities, they are separate identities, and he can value them as such. Would he not be better off, you know, killing himself to save as many of the other Ricks as possible? So just to answer this question, are Ricks values in contradiction in this scene? So I think we should all ask ourselves whether an argument which requires the development of a thought experiment using interdimensional portal guns and universe hopping technology is really a good argument. How valuable is this argument in the everyday sense of the word? If you would like to read anything about this, I would suggest reading Vico on perverse philosophy. As philosophy becomes more distant from reality, it loses its value and can be misleading. It can lead us to conclusions which which aren't actually the case whilst remaining logically consistent. Furthermore, why require us to formalize an argument in which you've already made a counter argument to? If you're saying that you couldn't understand the syntax of our argument and that you require us to formalize it so you can see the logical inference, how is it that you've understood it so well that you've already created a counter argument to try and defend against the conclusion of our argument? Seems to me like that's a little bit disingenuous and that you do understand the argument and that what you're relying upon is formal logic to pedantically hide or scapegoat onto to avoid actually questioning your philosophy. Just so you know, this is an absolutely disgusting and abhorrent use of formal logic, which is actually meant to resolve pedanticism. It's meant to resolve these issues and you're using it to create them. So it does have some value, it's just not an argument for veganism. Uh, yeah, the conclusion of Name the Trait isn't, therefore you should go vegan, it's, therefore your view can only deny the given non-human animal has moral value on pain of contradiction. You'd know this if you just read the argument, it's literally there in the conclusion. It's not really much of a criticism to say, the conclusion of this argument isn't something that isn't the conclusion of this argument. Kind of seems like that would apply to literally every argument ever. You may as well go criticize a UFC fighter for not being a ballerina. So Isaac, I know what the conclusion is. I know that it doesn't say veganism, like conclude you should be vegan, and that the conclusion is that you're in contradiction for not morally valuing animals. The point is, is that if you do come to the conclusion that you should morally value animals, then it's going to lead to veganism. That's kind of the argument, otherwise there'd be no sense in bringing it up in a vegan debate. What happens when the alternative occurs? When they are reinforced in their belief that they shouldn't be vegan, and that is what I want to avoid, because this argument is clearly inept. It cannot do anything along the lines of arguing that we should value animals, and in fact it's just an argument from induction. You compare likeness to likeness and argue that we should value one because we value the other, when this is not logically entailed. This argument is very poor. Do it again or abandon it. And if you guys want, I guess I can wreck perspective again, um, just because I made a video on him, maybe I should destroy him again, maybe that's good form, whatever. So I'll put a comment down there asking if I should debate him or not and I'll put a yes and a no comment below it, and you guys can like the yes or the no comment to determine whether I should wreck this uh, confused person again on whether name the trait violates the law of identity. So sorry to all of you who voted in the comment section below. Your divine leader has declined the debate on the point that he will not have a mod within it. Now, of course we'd need a mod, because Ask Yourself has a tendency of getting carried away and frustrated too easily, and obviously the debate doesn't flow correctly. I tried saying this to him, he didn't listen, so if you want to see a debate, and you truly actually do want to see it, tell him to debate me with a moderator. We can find a fair mod and have a good conversation. So I hope I have resolved any miscommunications here, Isaac, and that, you know, 
the semantic problem that you did bring up was in fact not a semantic problem. You should still question whether you're a quasi-realist because you are one. Also, with the other points, AIs cannot be in conflict with us unless they are sentient beings. That's just the way ethical conflict works. That me and Shadow were both willing to debate you and that the asking for formalization was an actual ploy to try and scapegoat away from questioning your argument and that name the trade is still an undefensible argument that breaks Leibniz's law or the conclusion does not follow. So either it's invalid or the first premise is incoherent. So I hope you've all enjoyed this video. If you'd like to support the channel and my attempts to resolve the problems I'm having with hardware, then please check out the PayPal link below. And of course, if you like my content, please give it a thumbs up, comment in the comment section below, and as always, try to gain some perspective. I know I've hit that threshold again where all the philosophy people are cringing. This is just like basic level nonsense.